Well, hey everyone, today is a very special day. As you can see, I'm out here at the church. I've chosen to change things up a little bit with the scenery and just to remind you that we are so soon to be back at church together. So I wanted to mix things up a little bit, remind you of what we're about to come back to. Uh, it's a beautiful day and we're here for a beautiful celebration. Today we are paying tribute to perhaps one of God's greatest gifts to humanity, and that is mothers. We so appreciate you mothers. Uh, I know that I appreciate my mother. I know it, it can't be said of everyone that they had a great mother, but I'm thankful to God today that I had a, a wonderful mom. And so much of her influence uh, has changed the course of my life. I'm here in part today because of a mother's prayers. My mother led me to Christ. She prayed for me through my childhood that I wouldn't become a criminal because she knew what was in my heart. My mother accomplished something that I still don't even understand to this day. You know, I had such a propensity to disobedience growing up. I was so bad. My orneriness could wear down just about anyone. But my mother remained patient in her discipline of me. And so I have this memory of growing up being spanked almost daily. I'm sure there were days that I wasn't spanked, but I have no, mem no memory, no recollection of those days. It just seemed like every day I was in trouble for something. I have this one particular memory of my mother sitting in a rocking chair in her bedroom. I was in trouble for something I had done, don't remember what, and she called me over for a spanking. And so I got spanked and I stood up, turned around, and I slapped at her in the air. Didn't hit her, just wanted, to, wanted her to know that I didn't appreciate being spanked. Well, that act of defiance was punished. She called me back over and I was spanked. And when I got up, I walked a little further this time and I turned around and I slapped at her in the air again. And she did one of these and I was back on her knee getting another spanking. And this must have happened six or seven times. Each time I would walk a little further from her, turn around and do the same. And I just remember the last time when I walked out the room, I turned the corner where she couldn't see me and I turned around and I slapped at her in the air. And I just remember hearing her voice from inside the room, Andy, are you slapping at me? <laughs> she knew me. And yet, when I think back to my mother and all those years of discipline, I can, one, I can say that I can never remember my mother spanking me in a fit of rage. And what she accomplished that's so amazing is that as I think back to my childhood and I try to remember my mom and think about her, I can't even picture her. I can't even imagine her with an angry face towards me. I can't picture my mother with a frown to this day. All I see in my mind's eye is a smile. That is a rare accomplishment. It shows something of her love, but her influence upon me in her prayers has changed the course of my life. My mom took her job as mother very seriously and she was good at what she did. One of the things that really saddens me right now as I look around the, the world at a, a present day movement that in large part is driven by women's desire to make a greater impact in society you know, let me just state very clearly, I believe in equal rights. I believe that ontologically by nature, men and women are equals. We are equally created in the image of God. Women have made such tremendous contributions uh, to society on, on all levels. But what saddens me about this current movement is that it so often divorces a woman's influence from her role in the home. I think it's great if, if women have jobs, if they become experts in their field. But I believe that the home is where their greatest power is wielded. When looking at their influence to society and the true impact they can have, many have forgotten the old adage, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. And there is a lot of truth to that statement. This is something that Theodore Roosevelt once said. He said, when all is said, it is the mother and the mother only who is a better citizen than the soldier who fights for his country. The successful mother, the mother who does her part in rearing and training aright the boys and girls who are to be the men and women of the next generation, is of greater use to the community and occupies, if she only would realize it, a more honorable as well as more important position than any man in it. The mother is the one supreme asset of national life. She is more important by far than the most successful statesman or businessman or artist or scientist. We understand the biblical model of the home. We understand that the men are supposed to be the head of the home and leaders. We don't apologize for that. But that doesn't mean that the men will have the most influence in their home. I remember the story of uh, G. Campbell Morgan, who is arguably one of the greatest preachers who, in my mind anyway, that's ever lived. He's a great uh, author as well. 
he and his godly wife raised four sons, and all of his sons became preachers. At one of their family reunions, one of the friends of the family asked one of the sons, so which Morgan is the greatest preacher? He looked over at his father and smiled and then said, Mother, <laughs> I may be the preacher in my home, but I can tell you that my, my wife, she's the one who's led our children to the Lord. Uh, she's the one who has taught them all the stories of the Bible since they were very little. She's had a tremendous influence upon our children, an influence that I as a father, I don't think I, I would ever have or ever will have. Mother's impact for good or evil will ultimately affect not only the direction of a child's life, but really it has an impact for generations to come. I was interested to find a study that was done in the late 1800s, and it was a study of two families and their impact upon society. Basically, it was following what's called the five generation rule, which basically says that your influence in your home will last for four generations. So they looked at two families, both of which started in the 1700s, uh, and they looked over about a 150 year period of time. And they looked first off at Jonathan Edwards' family. So many of you will know Jonathan Edwards, his godly wife, Sarah. Jonathan Edwards was one of the greatest theologians that was perhaps ever produced in America. He and his godly wife raised godly children. And 150 years later, looking back, this is the, the quality of some of their descendants. They had one dean of a law school, one dean of medical school, three U.S. senators, three governors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 60 doctors, 65 professors, 75 military officers, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, 100 clergymen, and 285 college graduates. <clears throat> their family made tremendous contributions to society, and their influence lasted for generations. And now around the same time of Jonathan Edwards, there was another man. His name was Max Jukes, and Max Jukes was an atheist. He married an ungodly lady, uh, and they encouraged their son to marry a lady named Ada. Ada Jukes became what is affectionately known as the mother of criminals. They traced 1,200 descendants over 150 years, and looking back, this is what they found. 300 of their descendants died prematurely. 440 were physically wrecked by alcohol. There were 310 paupers, 150 convicts, 190 prostitutes, 60 thieves, and 70, or seven rather, murderers. At the time when the study was done in 1877, they calculated that the Jukes family had cost the state of New York approximately $1.3 million, which today would be the equivalent of about $21 million. And that's for court costs, imprisonments, and all of that. In other words, they weren't a contribution to society. They became a drain on society. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. One of the things that I want to share with you today is the influence of a mother upon her child from Proverbs chapter 31. Most when they teach a Mother's Day lesson from Proverbs 31 will go immediately to verse 10 where you have this beautiful acrostic, this Hebrew acrostic of the virtuous woman. And it's a beautiful section of scripture, but very few have ever even looked at verses 1 through 9, which I think is just as important. So let me read for you Proverbs 31, and you're welcome to take up your Bibles and turn there if you have them. Proverbs 31 verse 1, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him, what, O my son, and what, O son of my womb, and what, O son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, or your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, or for rulers to desire strong drink, for they will drink and forget what is decreed, and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his trouble no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. We're looking at what Lemuel calls the oracle of his mother. The oracle means the burden. It means the heavy word. 
This was a serious conversation that Lemuel had had with his mother, probably as a young man, probably before he became king. As far as who Lemuel is, we don't exactly know. There's no record of him in history. Many have suggested that this is merely another name for Samuel, uh, that it's just talking about, Sa uh, I'm sorry, Solomon, Solomon and his mother Bathsheba. The word Lemuel, it simply means belonging to God. Now, whether or not this was Solomon, I don't know. But this king, we're just going to assume, just because we don't know, that it wasn't Solomon. This was obviously a man who had been dedicated to the Lord by his mother from the time he was either very young or before he was even born. He call, she calls him the son of her vow. You remember in 1 Samuel 1 verse 11, Hannah had made a vow to God that if he would give her a son, that she would dedicate her son to the Lord. And God did, and that was Samuel. It dramatically changes how we raise our children if we acknowledge that each of our children is Lemuel. Each of our children belongs to the Lord. They're not ultimately ours. But what we find here is a matter, a matter of counsel. Yes, even kings have mothers, and even kings need a mother's counsel. In the kingdom of Judah, the kings of old had a very special position for their mothers called the Jebira. Jebira means queen mother. We do have a glimpse of that from the life of Solomon and his mother Bathsheba, the passage in 1 Kings 2, where it says, So Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him. And the king arose to meet her, bowed before her, and sat on his throne. Then he had a throne brought for the king's mother. She sat on his right. In other words, this was a privileged position of honor. He was showing great respect to his mother. But by putting her at his right hand, he was also giving her authority. He recognized her value as a counselor. And here we have advice that is fit for a king. And the thrust of verses 1 through 9, essentially, that this mother is giving her son Lemuel. She's basically teaching him a life of selflessness, a life of self-denial, a life of service to others. And if you think about it, who is more qualified to encourage us to selflessness than a mother. Isn't that kind of the crowning virtue of a mother? Mothers are by nature sacrificial. They are selfless. Now many chalk this up to the typical advice, you know, that she's basically saying to her son, hey, don't chase women and don't drink beer. Well, there's so much more to it than that. It goes far deeper. There are three things she's gonna warn him about, speak to him about. One is women, wine, and then the weak. And in speaking to him about women, she's basically encouraging him to guard his heart. When she speaks to him about wine, she's teaching him to guard his head or his mind. And when she speaks to him about the weak, she's teaching him to guard his humanity. So in speaking of these three things that we're going to look at, she's aiming at something far deeper in his character. And so I want to look at each of these this morning for just a few moments. The first is she's going to talk to him about women. And in doing so, she's going to encourage him to guard his heart. Doesn't the proverb say, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life? So in verse 2, verse 3 rather, do not give your strength to women or your ways to that which destroys kings. Now first off, we would say that this is pretty insightful for her and any parent who acknowledges that their son's probably greatest battle in life will be lust, uh, will be his desire for women. And what she's basically divulging to him is that lust is a strength drainer. Some of you may be Rocky fans, and you might recall a scene in one of the Rocky movies where Rocky is working the heavy bag and Mickey is coaching him. And these two women walk up and they ask Rocky for his autograph. And you remember Mickey, he yells at the, the ladies, get out of here. And then he turns to Rocky and he says to him, women, weaken legs. Women weaken legs. In other words, this could be a diminishing of his strength. And wasn't that the case with Samson? Think about Samson for a moment. He was a man of great strength. What was it that ultimately brought him down and weakened him? Contrary to the advice of his parents who pleaded with him not to marry a Philistine, first off, he defied that. He went after the wrong woman and then he ended up with Delilah. That was a diminishing of his strength, a weakening of his legs, you might say. 
First thing we observe here in Proverbs 31 is that women is plural. So basically, she recognizes that as a king, he's going to be tempted to do what kings would do, which is to collect women, to have a harem. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17, we know that God discouraged this even before they had kings. God spoke to Israel and he said, there's going to be a day when I allow you to have a king. And God gave certain restrictions in verse 14 of Deuteronomy 17. When you enter the land with which the Lord your God gives you and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. And then down in verse 17, he shall not multiply wives for himself or else his heart will turn away nor shall he greatly increase silver gold for himself and it, it really it's a a section that encourages uh israel and their kings to not act like the kings around them and that's kind of what lemuel's mother was warning against we know that david's greatest greatest downfall in his life as king was his sin with bathsheba and this is Solomon's greatest downfall in 1 Kings chapter 11. In verse 1, it says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, You shall not associate with them, nor shall you, they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away from, uh, from oh, away after their gods. Solomon held fast to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. Well, if this was Solomon, if he is King Lemuel, then he failed to follow the council. Very well may be that this isn't Solomon, and that this king succeeded, but the point is, the kings of those days could be ruined by having many wives. I was reading this past week about Philip of Macedonia. Philip of Macedonia was father of Alexander the Great, but Philip had a number of wives. And it was the, perhaps the greatest thorn in his side as he reigned was the political undermining of his wives who were fighting constantly vying for power so that their sons would ultimately end up on the throne after Philip had died. And his one wife, Olympias, uh, she was Alexander the Great's mother, but she was the, the most sinister of all of them. And Philip was so disgusted with this wife of his that at one point he even uh, divorced her or uh, refused to have anything to do with her, at least for a time. But somehow she still proceeded to get her son upon the throne, and she did so by taking out some of his other wives, and many suggest that she's the one who ordered Philip's assassination. But having multiple wives was something that brought a great uh, deal of weakness to his, his kingdom. Let me just give you a word from Proverbs 31, a word of encouragement. This is for mothers and fathers as well. Talk to your children about the opposite sex. Tell them that there are consequences to marrying the wrong people. I was talking to a friend of mine in Michigan. They have a daughter who's 16, about Lydia's age, and they were friends uh, growing up. And he was telling me now that his daughter is 16, she wants to start dating. And there was a certain guy who was interested in taking her on a date. And so uh, I thought it was brilliant what he did, uh, what Rich did, the father. He said he took a a book on Christian sanctification and he gave it to the guy and he said I'll tell you what you can take my daughter on a date if you'll read this entire book and then sit down with me and have a conversation about it well the guy never came back he never even after that uh, never sought to uh, date his daughter but he like my wife and I we have a certain uh, view on on dating which essentially is to encourage our kids not to go run around dating as many people as you can trying to find a person you could marry but rather get to know people as you get older who you think wow this is a person maybe I could marry and then date them it's kind of backwards from the way things are encouraged today but I, I just say this and, and everyone's gonna have a different idea about dating I'm not saying we're, we're our way is better than anyone else's but I will say this that your child is royalty they are God's children 
They are heir of all things and will one day reign with Christ. Encourage them to look for someone who is befitting a, king, a, a prince or a princess. To find someone who will add to their strength and not diminish it. That is one of the responsibilities of the mother and the father. The second thing we see here is Lemuel's mother speaks to him about wine. And in doing so, she's going to talk to him about guarding his mind in verse 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. For they will drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. So the NLT says, uh, it is not for the king to guzzle wine. Rulers shouldn't crave liquor. I spoke to you a moment ago about Olympias, the mother of Alexander the Great. She was by far his greatest influence in life. There was none in his life. Not one of his generals had the same influence over him that his mother did. She empowered Alexander as he grew up. She suggested to him that he was a descendant of Achilles and later said that Zeus, not Philip, was his actual father. He developed an ego, a God complex. He learned a lot of depraved morals from his mother and many say that that's where he ultimately received his thirst for blood by watching her in her ways. This is a man who conquered mercilessly. But you know what it was his undoing? You know what ultimately brought down Alexander the Great? It was his alcoholism. He could defeat any army, but he could not defeat his own addictions. He had a two-day drinking spree where many say he developed alcohol poisoning. And he attempted to treat it by, get this, drinking a bowl of unmixed wine, which was very strong wine. He died. 32 years old. Here's a guy, a great strategizer. He was a great leader of his people as far as building an empire. He had ambition. He had brains. But by the most important measurements, he was far from being a great man. Here, Lemuel's mother, she was warning him about the results of being an alcoholic like many kings of their day. The, the impact would be impaired judgment. And judgment was to be the king's greatest asset. That's something he needed above anyone else in his kingdom. And by the way, with Alexander, to show how, how much that his drinking affected his judgment, he became so unpredictable in his latter years that at one point in one of his drunken fits, he actually threw a spear and killed the man who was one of his closest friends, a guy who had saved him in battle and after he sobered up and realized what he had done, Alexander, it says, cried for three days straight. He had regret. This passage here, it is about so much more than alcohol. It's about anything that inhibits our sober-mindedness, our judgment. And it, believe me, there are a lot more things out there than alcohol that have that capability. I personally think electronics and video games and certain things can do that to our children. That can change their inhibitions. That can play havoc on their judgment and I've seen it with my own kids I let my kids play video games and electronics but I've seen moments where they've they've gotten so numbed and dulled out by some of that stuff and, and it just even can change it looks seems like their their mindset and so I think there's a lot of things in in the life of a child that can affect their sober-mindedness and the Bible in first Peter 5 tells us to be sober-minded because we have an adversary the devil who like a roaring lion seeks about whom he may devour one of the reasons that you find that alcoholism uh, so prevalent in a lot of pagan religions is because the, the enemy delights when people lower their inhibitions, when they start changing their ability to make judgment calls, because that's when people make mistakes. That's when people end up with major regrets in their lives. Now, of course, many of the fundamental churches have combated this or sought to combat this by teaching their children that drinking in, in itself is an evil, that you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it at all. Well, one of the things we see in this passage here, when she's talking to her son, she, she says in her day, there was actually a valid use for the, the alcohol, says, give strong drink to him who is perishing. In other words, to the person who is dying, it would be a mercy to them to give them strong drink. 
Wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. There were a lot of medicinal uses for wine in those days. And you, you recall the story of the, the, the Good Samaritan and how he rubbed oil and wine into the, into the wounds of the man who had been injured. Paul himself told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake. So we know the Bible doesn't prohibit it. Jesus turned water into wine. If it was evil, if it was wrong, he wouldn't have done that. We all know the passage in Ephesians 5, be not drunk with wine, which is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The point is, is not to partake of it to the point where you no longer have your own judgment, where it now owns you versus you being in control over it. We don't go to that extreme where we say that it's forbidden, but that gives us a certain responsibility for those of us who partake to remind our kids there is a danger there that it can be abused and that if so if, if it is abused then it will cause an impairment of judgment and it can cause many regrets in their lives and of course our responsibility goes far beyond counseling our kids in the use of things like alcohol it comes down to our example and us demonstrating the, that moderation the third and final thing is Lemuel's mother speaks to him about the weak, and here she is teaching him to guard his humanity. In verse 8, she says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. We, we begin to see a pattern emerging here where she's essentially talking more about the responsibility of his leadership role versus the privilege. You know, Olympias empowered her son by building up his ego, by suggesting that he was godlike. He went through life trampling upon the weak, oppressing others. A good mother will empower her children with true strength of compassion, a force that is greater than any standing army. You teach your children compassion and they will conquer in this world, but they will conquer for good. They will make the world a better place. Here she says to him, speak to those who have no voice. Some of you are familiar with William Wilberforce. He lived in the 1700s and when William was nine years old, his father died. His mother was too ill to care for him, so she sent him to his aunt and uncle's house. For two years, he lived with his aunt and uncle, and perhaps the greatest influence upon William was his aunt Hannah. And this is meant to be more of a word for you ladies who aren't mothers yet, uh, or maybe never could become a mother for various reasons, and you're thinking, well, this kind of leaves me out. There's, this doesn't, doesn't help me or doesn't give me any great purpose as a woman. Well, it wasn't ultimately William's mother who had the great impact on him, it was his aunt doesn't matter whether it's your child or not, if you're an aunt or you're a grandmother, whatever your relation is, you can have impact upon the coming generations. And let me tell you about her impact upon William. When he was in their home for just two years, they made sure that William attended church with them. He attended the services of guys like George Whitfield, one of the greatest evangelist preachers who ever lived. William was converted at the age of 12, and his mother, upon hearing about his new Christian enthusiasm, she actually sought to remove him from the influence of his aunt and uncle. But it was too late. The seeds had been sown. And the aunt had also, along with guys like George Whitfield, she had introduced him to her half-brother, John Newton. Some of you will recognize that name. He was a former slave trader, the most famous evangelical in London in his day, and the author of what is the most famous him that has ever been written, Amazing Grace. This was a, to become a mentor of William. And his experience there, just over that period of two years, led him ultimately back to a life where he was like John Newton, living for those who had no voice for themselves. He spent his life fighting the slave trade. He was a wealthy man, as well as fighting slavery in Parliament. He volunteered in over 69 different societies and used much of his wealth in those societies making contributions but 
Here's a few of the societies he was involved in. He was involved in a missionary society where they were sending out missionaries, a society for the bettering of the condition of the poor, one that um, relieved the suffering of the poor workforce, the French refugees in foreign in uh, the foreign in distress. He helped to reform hospital care, asylums, penitentiaries. This is a guy who gave his whole life to speaking out on behalf of those who had no voice. And it was his Aunt Hannah, it was her influence primarily upon him that led him to that life. Two years of influence resulted in the slave trade being abolished, and three days before William's death, a law being passed that emancipated all the slaves in the British Empire. You know, we credit these great men in history. We applaud the things that they do. But I would wager that in many cases, and probably in most cases, we're paying silent tribute to their mothers, that they became the men that they were because of their mother. Just read your Bible and think of the great men that you admire in Scripture, and then look at their mothers. Think about Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Jochebed, who was the mother of Moses. Hannah, Manoah, that was Samson's mother, Naomi, Elizabeth, Mary, Eunice, who was the, the mother of Timothy, and you can include in there Lois, his grandmother. Ten mothers whose children changed the world, in large part because of their influence. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I want to thank you mothers for taking the time to mold your children because in doing so you are shaping this world. And I realize that motherhood can many times feel like you're not making a great contribution to society because I understand motherhood. I understand that it's hard, it's tiring, it's thankless work. And the progress that you make in molding your children is incremental and it's slow. But don't lose heart. I believe that you have a very honored place in this world and your selfless care of your children is going to outlive you for generations to come. Father, thank you for mothers today. I know that my mother had a dramatic, profound influence upon my life, and I know that so many others can say the same. And even if there are those who can't say that today, didn't have that great experience with their mother, maybe the challenge for them would be to become what their parents weren't, to become that great mother, Lord, and have that influence. Whether they're a mother or not, Lord, the influence is, is a possibility. There are people out there who need mentored, young ladies and others who, who are looking for a, a mother, motherly figure. I pray for our mothers today to receive a tremendous blessing for their contribution to this world and to the Church of Jesus Christ. Lord, as I look around at churches today, not just our own, but the churches I've seen and experienced in my life, I find that so often it's the women, it's the mothers, Lord, who outshine everyone else. I think back even to the days of Jesus Christ, where it was the women who were faithful to stand by him. They were the ones who had that bold courage, Lord, to be there on the Sunday morning and were the first to be honored with the resurrection and the appearance of Jesus, Lord. There's something special that you've put in the heart of women, a dedication, a devotion, that runs so much deeper, I think, than even the heart of, of any man. Lord, help us to appreciate our mothers, our spiritual mothers, our, the ladies, Lord, in our church who are worthy of such great honor. I thank you, Lord, for putting me here and allowing me to meet so many others. And, and thank you, Lord, for my own wife, who is a great mother to my children. And I just want to praise you and thank you for her today and the impact that she's having, not just upon my kids, but the the generations to come. So thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining me here. Uh, at least we're one step closer to the church. I give you a, a nice image of, of what we're soon to be back to. And let me just reaffirm that we are working hard as a, a elder board to make the decisions necessary to see that we are back when it's safe and when it's timely. And I believe that God can lead us in that. So would you pray for us as a board to have wisdom on these matters? Uh, we know that, that all of you are looking forward to getting back in fellowship with 
one another and doing so in person. And so uh, we are just as excited about that. We just want to make sure we have God's heart and God's mind as far as how to plan that out. Uh, we'll be meeting this coming Tuesday to make discussion about when exactly things can start returning back to normal. So I covet your prayers for that. As always, uh, we want to just encourage you to stay engaged. I know it's difficult these final weeks when we're doing it via social media, but please stay engaged. Uh, please sh hit the like button, share these videos. Let's keep, keep the momentum going for the time that we have. We want to make sure that when we get back to church, we hit the ground running. Well, a special blessing to you mothers today. Uh, thank you once again for who you are and for what you do. Lord bless you, and I will talk to you again very soon. Take care.